Hi, we're Josh and Arielle Wamsley, owners of Green Valley Tree LLC, based in North Wyndham. We're proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week and to serve the communities of Wyndham and New London counties with our tree removal and plant health care services. Visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com for a full list of our services or give us a call on 860-234-4041. We look forward to hearing from you. They're part of a nationwide organization that pays tribute to the nation's veterans. We join Honor Flight Connecticut on their trip to Washington, D.C. as they celebrate veterans from our state. Plus, we take a look at other stories making the headlines from around the region. This is Connecticut East This Week. Hello, I'm Brian Scott-Smith. It's Memorial Day weekend and the nation honours and remembers its veterans from all branches of the military in all wars and conflicts. In this very special Connecticut East this week, we were privileged to be part of a trip to Washington, D.C., organised by the non-profit Honor Flight Connecticut, who help organise trips to the nation's capital and war memorials for our veterans. They are a hub of the larger Honor Flight organisation, and through the generosity of many, veterans get to travel for free for the day and are celebrated for their service and sacrifice to the country. I joined them bright and early one Saturday morning as they arrived at Brad Bradley International Airport, presidential style in a cavalcade headed by state police to crowds of people waiting to cheer them on. Well, good morning. How are we doing so far? How was that entrance? So my name is Dan Sparks. I'm the co-founder of Honor Flight Connecticut. And I am both excited and humbled to be with you here this morning. To the 47 veterans and honorees that we have seated in the front of the room today, I welcome you. I welcome you to the Spring 2023 Honor Flight. I welcome you to your Day of Honor. And from all of us here at Honor Flight, a welcome home. To the folks standing around the perimeter of the room, both in uniform and out, I say thank you. Thank you for getting up bright and early and spending your Saturday morning with us. Thank you for your enthusiasm towards our guests today. And thank you for championing and echoing our appreciation of the 47 folks seated up front today. Will Rogers once said, we can't all be heroes because somebody needs to sit on the curb and clap as the heroes go by. And I believe we just brought Will's quote to life. As you warmly welcomed our guests and as we will continue to do throughout the day today. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited for all of you to experience the program we put together for you today, and I invite you to sit back, enjoy, soak it up, take it in. You've got a lot of fans here. You're going to have a lot of fans in our nation's capital. It's all for you. Enjoy it. Major General Francis J. Yvon Jr. is going to push me out of the way. So, so I want to say thanks to Dan, and uh, thank you. We're here because of you, those veterans, 
and uh, and there's there's no introduction needed. Uh, we have great people. We have we those who have served know that you cannot accomplish anything without great people around you covering your back, covering your six. So I want to say thank you and welcome home. And how about another round of applause for all of our 47 veterans here today? I'm truly honored and humbled to be here this morning. Once again, this is one of the best events that we do throughout the year and always trying to support Dan and his team. So first of all, uh, you know, first of all, we live in a nation uh, right now in some pretty trying times. And all of those here who have served for May, right? May is the beginning of uh, is Memorial Day month for most citizens who probably are still tucked in under the covers right about now. Uh, May and Memorial Day is, is the beginning of summer, right? The beginning of hot dogs and hamburgers and picnics. But for those of you here today who have served, no otherwise. And for that, we thank you. So on behalf of the 5,000 men and women of our Connecticut Military Department, the Connecticut National Guard, I want to start off by saying thank you. Thank you to each of you for your service and for your sacrifice. My name is Dee Smith, and I was a Spec 5 in the United States Army. Donna Smith, and I was in the Army uh, Nurse Corps, second lieutenant, first lieutenant. <laughs> second came first, and then first came second. <laughs> so you are the first, as we understand it, husband and wife team on this flight, Vietnam veterans. What does this day mean to both of you? Well, I, I think it means a lot. It's, uh, they, they put a lot of effort into, um, you know, honoring the veterans, and uh, I feel honored that I was selected, and I think so does Donna. Yes. Well, I am not a Vietnam veteran. I'm a Vietnam-era veteran because I didn't serve in the Vietnam. To Vietnam, she was stateside, but she, she was in during the conflict. So I just wanted to give them, you know, that kind of... Well, you were still supporting the troops, even though you were back here. Definitely. I was supporting, right, I was supporting the troops, and so it was my pleasure. And She was fortunate that she didn't have to uh, tend to any of the Vietnam vets that, that got messed up. She was a pediatrics nurse, so she was kind of fortunate there that she took care of all the, uh, the uh, GI babies, if you will, at Fort Ord, California. Tell us a little bit about how you met. Did you, did you meet during this time? You're, you're nodding your head here. I had a friend that was a medic at the hospital at Fort Ord, California. And uh, he asked me one time if I would like a blind date. And I said, well, I, I don't know about a blind date. And he goes, no, I'd like to introduce you to her. She's a really nice person. And so he introduced me to uh, Donna, and uh, we started dating for about a year, and then we got married. Yeah, right. Well, when, when he um, met me, I was working in the newborn nursery unit, and so I was all covered in my white uniform and my mask, so he really couldn't see what I looked like <laughs> until after, till a later date. We're talking to Morris Brazard, World War II veteran. Today, sir, we are at the World War II Memorial here in Washington, D.C. This isn't the first time you've been here, but it's... No, it's not. Just explain to us how this makes you feel. It's much different. They had this, half of the statues up. They did not have the fountains in. They were still working on it. So it was limited what you could see here. But this is a big change. I've just been here for the last 10 minutes. and I've been, The weather's with us. The company's with us. And my, my son, who was in the Army... He's a medical doctor, and he's pushing me around, and I'm very fortunate. When you come here, I know this is only the, the second time you've been here. How does it make you feel knowing that this is a memorial to people like yourself, who are still with us, thankfully, and also, you know, colleagues who have passed? Well, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I'm 94, and I was in the Pacific for two years. I was stationed on Guam. I was in communications. And I did come back, and I come from a big family of nine people. I have four brothers, two or five boys. We all saw service. My brother hit uh, Normandy, and my older brother was in the Pacific, 
and I went in the Pacific too when the war was fairly over. And uh, we're all fortunate to come back. Today, I've lost three of them. I only have one brother left. And I also, out of the family of nine, I had a sister who was in the Navy, and she was in World War II. And uh, other than that, I've been very fortunate to be back and enjoying life. Dan Sparks, co-founder of Honor Flight Connecticut. Dan, we are, and you can hear it in the background the gorgeous water and fountains here at the World War II Memorial in D.C. Talk to us about why you and your father decided to start the Connecticut chapter of Honor Flight. Yeah, it was 2019. At the time, Connecticut didn't have an Honor Flight. Uh, They had a couple variations of it in the past that, for whatever reason, cease to exist as you can feel today these these guys and gals these these ladies and gentlemen need to be honored they deserve to be honored they earned it and we owe them a bit of gratitude and this is our way of saying thank you we appreciate everything you did for us and and we're honored and humbled to do it it's just they're great and they're just remarkable individuals that deserve to see their memorials and deserve a day of honor it must be incredible for some of them because for some it's their very first time seeing these memorials and of course this memorial that we're sat at has had upgrades so of course it's changed from when it was originally opened what sort of reaction and what sort of comments do you get back from you know the veterans when they've come here or when they're actually on their trips with you we've had the speechless when they get off the plane at night they just have nothing to say it's it's just they love the day folks telling us it's the greatest day of their life we have children and nephews and nieces and grandkids saying Thank you for what you did for my uncle, my father, my grandfather, you know, grandmother in, in many cases. He or she needed this closure and needed this day of honor, and they, they just lightened up and they started talking. They never talked before. Like I said, we owe it to them. It's, it's just great to see them in this environment amongst each other with the family, with the guardians. In many cases, it's friends, and it's really their day of honor that they never got when they came back from whatever conflict they were in. Richard Osborne, you're a veteran of the Korean War. We are stood here at the Korean War Memorial. What's your first impressions of it? This is the first time you've seen it, I believe. Well, it's uh, like it was with the ponchos, and because uh, in the summer it rained a lot. It looks like it was. As you stand here now, what memories is this bringing back to you, other than you've said, obviously, the ponchos? Can you give us a sense well, of what you're feeling? I lost a lot of friends over there. Some are still MIAs. It was a tough, tough winter and a tough summer. I was there on the uh, wounded in March of 53. I went back up on line. And I was there on a hospital ship for a second time, uh, Haven in Inchon Harbor, And uh, when, when it ended, because I got wounded seven days before it ended, July 27, 1953. What does it mean for you to be here today, sir, standing here? at this incredible memorial? Well, I think the whole thing is uh, almost brings tears to your eyes with the, the send-off we got and the people are so uh, appreciative of, which was the Korean War was kind of a forgotten war between World War II and Vietnam, and it was good. It really was a good, a good thing that happened to us. Yeah. Why was it important for you to come here today? Well, I wanted to see the memorials, not just the... Korean War, but the Vietnam and the, the World War II Memorial. My uncle served in the World War II, and I did donate to that when they, when they built that. So, uh, in his name, it means a lot to see all these people that are interested in staying free. You say, you say that, of course, sadly, the world still is full of conflict. Do we ever learn anything, do you feel, from this? I mean, as somebody who was so entrenched in you know, the Korean War... Are we learning anything from any of this, do you feel? I hope these people are. They come here and see that, you know, we got to hold on to what we got and uh, don't give in. Richard Hanratty, you are a Vietnam veteran. We are here at the Vietnam War Memorial. You've found the name of your uncle and you've traced it. What does it mean to you to be here today and also to take home that that tracing of his name. John has two daughters that we recently met within the last few years. We didn't even know he had. So I'm going to send this to him when I get home. Let him know we're here. We paid homage to him, you know? Yeah. 
how are you feeling emotionally right now? Because even though you visited here before, I mean, this must bring, bring back emotions. The, the first time I was here, which was many, many years ago, I remember standing here and crying. This time, it's, it's a little bit more um, acceptable, I guess, because it's been so many years. It's been 55 years, right? So it's, it's not as emotional now as it was the first time it... Uh, it's the 50th anniversary this year of America stepping away from the Vietnam War. Does it mean even more because it's the 50th year or not? Somebody summed it up at the Korean Monument just a few minutes ago and said that uh, nobody wins in war. Everybody loses, both sides. We're at the end of the day and mail call, which of course meant so much back then. How did it make you feel today? Uh, it made me feel very special and... Uh, I know when I was in Vietnam, that's all we looked forward to. And when mail call came around and you didn't get a letter or something, uh, you were disappointed and you couldn't wait for the next day to see if it might come, something. Is there anything in there that's particularly, obviously you'll take it back and read them at length, but was there anything in there that you were particularly pleased to see or struck a chord with you? I didn't get to read most of it, but uh, the whole package, the whole package. It's just great, terrific, yeah. Looking around, obviously, a lot of emotion for many of your fellow veterans. As I said, you know, this meant a big deal back then. I mean, now, of course, we have many ways to communicate with each other, but this really was the most important thing. Yeah, that's very true. And sometimes it would be days or weeks or maybe two weeks before you'd get anything because, you know, back then mail was slow and everything like that. So, but yeah. Today, it's different, and the troops today, they have their emails and their phones and all that. We didn't, we didn't have that then. And they, right, exactly. Yeah, they can do FaceTime and stuff, which would have been great if we had that then, which we didn't. So mail was very important to us. We loved it. The family members didn't hear about the loss of their, uh, their son or daughter because of the... Yeah. Well, and it took time for them to get the message that, you know, maybe their son was... Missing in action or something. That's, that, that was hard. Yeah. So, final thoughts from both of you. It's the end of the day. We're waiting for the flight back. How's the day been? Oh, it's been perfect. I couldn't, couldn't have asked for anything better. It was just magnificent. They really put a big, huge effort into this thing. And I think everybody on this flight, all the veterans, really appreciate it. Terrific. That's all I can say. Staff Sergeant Mateau. Okay. Can I come and interrupt you? Oh, I know yeah. this is a very personal moment right yeah. now. Uh, Were you expecting this? And it's obviously very emotional. Can you talk to us a little bit about it? In a minute. Sergeant <laughs> This is for my kids and my grandkids uh, about all the things they remember that we did together. And usually, as life goes on, you don't hear about these things. You don't know what impact you you may or may not have. And of all the things other than marrying this woman here that I've ever done, it's those kids. We love what we do. We're humbled and honored to, to be a part of what we are, and we're just happy to almost just travel amongst heroes and giants. Talk to us a little bit more, obviously, about you know when you and your father decided to create the Connecticut chapter of, of Honor Flight, because your dad, if I got this right, it, it, was in New York State. You came to Connecticut, and he was talking this up, and people didn't know what he was talking about. That's exactly how it happened. He retired to Connecticut from upstate New York and just talked so proudly and, and with such enthusiasm about what they did in the Albany chapter, leather stocking honor flights. And people would look at him. They had no idea what honor flight was or what we do. So he said, we need to start a chapter. And, and we got the pencil to the paper, and we started applying and 501c3 and all the filings and in 2019 about four months after that initial conversation we had an honor flight off the grounds the first flight we did was 23 all world war ii individuals in october of 19 and then the pandemic hit so we were down for about two years and resumed in 22 with two flights last year we'll do two this year and we have aspirations of doing three or four a year going forward and where does the money come from this? Because, again, the beautiful thing about this is no veteran pays for this. And that's all fundraising. We've got a, a nice kind of balance of corporate and personal donors. We've been fortunate lately, for, for all the wrong reasons, we've made some obituaries where people you know, ask for donations be sent to this from folks from prior flights. 
But it's almost like I mentioned earlier. It, it, it's not hard to fundraise for what we do. You know, believe me, we could use more. The more money we raise, the more veterans we find, the more honor, you know, the more honoring we could do. But there's a lot of organizations and individual donors who love what we do and, and put their money be, where their mouth is and fund us. Uh, your father's just stepped in and he didn't think he was going to get asked a question. Matt, just come here a second as I talk to Dan. He's told us, obviously, about the creation between both of you of Honor Flight CT. I want to ask you this question. How proud of Dan are you about this? Incredibly. But it's a mission that we're all very committed to because, as you could see, being part of our day, this is something that's obviously overdue. Our veterans need to know how much they're appreciated. They need to know how much that their sacrifice meant to the future generations and we're honored and we're privileged to be part of this and to be able to, to bring this to fruition for, for the residents of Connecticut and Western Massachusetts and our, our area. So Dan's, um, Dan's got the same passion that I do. We're, we're committed to carrying this thing as far as we can, and our committee um, feels the same way. And we're, uh, we're very committed and we're uh, borderline possessed, but we're, we're, uh, we're pretty committed on on bringing this thing uh, forward and keeping it going and make sure that uh, we keep going until we get every one of our vets uh, that served our country and get down our three memorials. So thank you. Thank you, guys. My thanks again to Dan and Matt Sparks, co-founders of Honor Flight Connecticut, and to the rest of their amazing team, and of course, to all of the veterans that day on the flight who were truly amazing. We, of course, are indebted to you all for your service. If you want to find out more about Honor Flight Connecticut and maybe put forward a veteran for a future flight, or perhaps you want to help sponsor future flights, then visit their website at honorflightct.org. You love cookies, so you are going to love the ARC's Golden Chip Giveaway. Find the Golden Chip and select the bags of the ARC Eastern Connecticut's Classic Crunch Chocolate Chip Cookies and win a free platter of cookies. Visit the ARCECT.com to find a cookie retailer near you and how eating our cookies support jobs for people with disabilities. Visit our cookie factory at 22 Route 171 in Woodstock, Connecticut. Golden Chips may be hiding in bags there too. Get buying, start winning. It's mulch season, so come and visit Green Valley Tree LLC. We have a variety of colors for all your landscaping needs. Buy as much or as little as you want. Pick it up or we can deliver to your door. Call Green Valley Tree LLC for all your mulch, plant health care, and tree service needs at 860-234-4041. We are family owned and fully licensed. Is it time to earn your high school diploma and build a brighter future? EastCon's adult education programs can help. With EastCon's free NEDP program, there are no tests, and you can work at your own pace. You can even earn your diploma in as little as 6 to 12 months. An EastCon advisor will help you succeed from registration to graduation. Scheduling and locations are flexible. The program is free. Registration is open now. Go to EastCon.org and click on Adult and Community Programs and build your brighter future today. Time now for a look at other stories making the headlines this week, sponsored by... You may think you need to travel to large medical centers to get the latest cancer clinical trials. But at Eastern Connecticut Hematology and Oncology, or ECHO, we offer dozens of leading clinical trials, matching clinical trials to the needs of our patients and getting studies opened in just days, giving our patients the latest innovation in cancer care. To learn more about our cutting-edge research, visit echoassociates.org slash trials. The Connecticut Office of State Ethics has issued a second $10,000 civil penalty against Seabury PFRA LLC, also known as Seabury Marine, for violating the state's code of ethics for lobbyists. 
From 2017 through 2019, Seabury was acting as a lobbyist before the Connecticut Port Authority, a quasi-public agency here in Connecticut, as they attempted to gain contracts and other businesses from that agency. According to the Ethics Office investigation, Seabury spent monies in excess of $3,000, which triggered the requirement for them to register their activity with the Office of State Ethics. They also did not complete any required financial disclosure. Seabury compensated employees, members and or agents to lobby the Port Authority, including one individual who had a relationship not only with Seabury, but was also a member of the Port Authority Board of Directors at the time. That individual has not been named. Seabury was previously fined by the Office of State Ethics for providing impermissible illegal gifts to staff and board members of the Connecticut Port Authority, which they accepted, resulting in one Port Authority employee, Andrew Levine, being fined $750 and suspended from work for two days, and Port Authority board member Donald Frost being removed from the authority's Port of Directors altogether. In signing this latest order, Seabury did not admit liability, and by agreeing to pay the second $10,000 civil penalty, will avoid a legal hearing on the matter. Faculty at Connecticut College say they have been shut out by the school's Board of Trustees in the search for the college's new interim president, who will replace President Catherine Bergeron when she steps down in late June. Afshan Jafar is a professor at the school's Department of Sociology and said the normal course of action would be to appoint the Dean of Faculty as interim, but that's not what's happening. Let the dean of the faculty, who would traditionally be in this position anyway, who is the second in command after the president, take up the interim position. But they bypassed that option. Now they're spending more money on a search firm and they're bypassing faculty expertise all in the name of efficiency and expediency when all their decisions are actually costing them a lot more and slowing down the process. A spokesperson for the college confirmed they are using a search firm to find the next interim president and that Board of Trustee member Karen Quint, who is a partner at the search firm, is recused from the appointment process, sparking concerns by faculty of a conflict of interest in the process. The school also confirmed that faculty were not part of the search for the interim president, but would be included in the search for the permanent president later this year. Chris Steiner is a professor of art history and anthropology at Connecticut College and says a current board member, though, is being considered for the interim position and tried to excuse himself from a meeting recently when faculty asked the question. The majority of the board has been appointed by Catherine Bergeron. The person that you mentioned who spoke up at the meeting was appointed fairly recently by Catherine Bergeron because of their friendship with the president. And I do think that having someone like that in place is really not going to do anything towards moving us forward. The board member in question is Les Wong, a former president of San Francisco State University who resigned in late 2018 after facing criticism of his administration's response to anti-Semitic incidents at the school over a number of years and during his tenure there. A Connecticut College spokesperson also declined to comment on the possible selection or otherwise of Wong or any other candidate for the interim president position. And Elsa M. Nunes, the sixth president of Eastern Connecticut State University, has announced her retirement from the school. Nunes began her presidency in 2016, 18 years ago, and her last day will be in July, although she says she will stay at the university beyond that date to help with the transition to a new president. In a letter to the university community, Nunes wrote, 18 years ago, I visited Eastern for the first time and I fell in love. I encountered a beautiful campus, inspiring students, dedicated faculty and and staff and engaged alumni. From that very first visit, I knew that Eastern was more than where I wanted to be. The first Latina to serve as a university president in New England, Nunez is credited with many significant accomplishments during her 18 years at the helm of Connecticut's designated Public Liberal Arts University. Under her leadership, Eastern has climbed steadily in US News and World Report's annual best college rankings and now ranks 19 among 63 public regional institutions in the North Region, an area spanning 11 states and the District of Columbia. That's all from us for this edition. Do send us your questions and story ideas to the show via our website at connecticut-east.com or Facebook or Twitter at Connecticut East and on Instagram at Connecticut East This Week. And you can listen to the show again on our social platforms on demand and by asking your smart speaker to play Connecticut East This Week podcast. And please like, follow and share on your social media too. 
I'm Brian Scott-Smith. Thank you for listening.